Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. I've come here tonight on the 27th of August 2017 to do the next reading of the wonderful book we are reading for the moment, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Yeah, and why am I calling that a wonderful book? <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually, the best thing that could happen is that books like these would not have been necessary to be written. Because there were no Jesuits, or there are no Jesuits. Because there is no devil. Because there is no Antichrist. Because we are all living in Jesus Christ's kingdom. That would be just great. But as long as we have to fight with the powers of this world, which are not carnal, but spiritual, we have to deal with the problems they cause in this world, on our earth and on our in our lives, in all of our lives. And that's why we have to educate people about the necessity of understanding the past to when you learn from the past, you can really understand the present time. And when that gets you to the Bible, you will also understand what will happen in the future. And, you know, this movie they brought out at the end of the 1990s, Conspiracy Theory, I think it was called, with uh, Mel Gibson, if I'm not mistaken, and Julia Roberts at that time. Just in time before a few years later, 9-11 hit and the world changed. I think that a lot of people did not understand until the 11th of September of 2001 how many changes this world is going to undergo. But to me, now looking back in 2017 to what happened in 2001, I think that the New World Order agenda really switched over into a higher gear. And a lot of people, because of that higher gear, all of a sudden woke up, you know? It's like this one scene that I <laughs> always laugh on when my mother watches this movie Overboard, you know, with Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. <laughs> and that mother, in the end, when she turns the boat around and, uh, and uh, speeds the boat up, all of a sudden she glides out of her bed, you know? A lot of people with 9-11 uh, fell out of their bed out of their comfort zone and woke up to things. And now a lot of people are searching for the truth all around the world and are led by many people into many different directions. And some tell them, oh, it's the Jews. And others say, oh, it's the Freemasons. And others say, oh, it's the Bilderberger, and it's the CFR, and it's the United Nations, and it's this, and it's that. And, well, only diligent study of the Bible, where God tells us who it really is, will lead us to the knowledge that we understand that all the just mentioned, forementioned, whether secret or open societies or whatever, are all just puppets on the strings of the Antichrist of the Bible. Therefore, of course, we first have to understand who the Antichrist is. And just this weekend I released a video on my YouTube channel uh, in German. The Pope is the Antichrist, it was called. It was about 15 minutes or something, and that was an excerpt that I did from a reading from uh, this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Yeah, you heard me right. I read The Secret History of the Jesuits, as you know, this book, in German. And in one of these readings, I was explaining about the Antichrist. Why? Because the week before that, I uploaded a video on my channel, that you also know, because I uploaded that in German and in English, and that was called, If um, Evolution is True, Why Are We Living in 2017? And there were people in German commenting on that video, by, because I was mentioning the Pope being the Antichrist, saying, oh, the Pope is not the Antichrist. I said, well, it's probably a necessity when I read this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, to inform some people about who the Antichrist is very first. 
because there are a lot of people who don't understand it. And it's, it's, it's logical they don't understand, because the whole world has been deceived, as the Bible, of course, foretold. God will send them strong delusion, and he did. And people love to be deceived, because when they believe a lie, they don't have to think for themselves. They believe that, that is proposed to them by whatever, media, persons they trust in, politicians, teachers, uh, friends, family, whoever. It is so much more comfortable to believe a lie than to really go on search for the real truth. And the real truth is that Jesus was and is the Christ. He is the Messiah who came and went to the cross for the forgiveness of all our sins, for all who believes in him. And as sure as in the Law and the Prophets, what most of the people call the Old Testament, it was, it was made in there to tell the Israelites who their Messiah was when he comes, especially in Daniel chapter 9. And of course, the whole Law and the Prophets deals with the coming of Jesus Christ. It starts at the latest point in Genesis 3 verse 15 when God says that he will put enmity between Satan and the woman, between him, his seed and her seed. And uh, she will crush his head and he will bruise his heel. That is as, at, uh, at least there, that is the earliest announcement, if not even earlier, but could be wrong, I wouldn't say dogmatically that is the first time, but that is the first time that I really understood that it is mentioned that there is coming a Messiah. Genesis 3.15 And um, Daniel 9 made it very clear the timeline when Jesus Christ is coming. And so the whole Old Testament with the Mosaic law about sacrificial uh, with all the sacrificial ornaments that they, they had been done, all the sacrifices that had to be done in the temple and all that stuff that was all pointing to Jesus Christ. Now in the New Testament, we have many, many points that point to the adversary of that Christ. In the Old Testament it was told when Christ comes, in the New Testament it is told when Antichrist comes. With the same sincerity, with the same precision as in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was announced in the New Testament the Antichrist was announced. The Antichrist, as Daniel described him in chapter 7, is the little horn that comes out of the ten horns into that the pagan Roman Empire will fall. And out of these ten horns arises in the middle of them a little horn. Well, the Vatican is a kingdom. It is the smallest kingdom in the world, only a few acres big. And it is the, uh, the, the eleventh, the little horn, that grows out of the ten. And then we have Paul, who speaks in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And of course, the whole chapter is interesting to read, but just, just to get into Second Thessalo uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, let me pick up my Bible here. I have my Bible here, so I can I can quote that right from the Bible. And I I like to I love to do that as long as I have it really here. Second Thessalonians two verse seven. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is a very sure announcement of when the Antichrist comes and where the Antichrist arises from. You know. Because Paul was speaking to the Thessalonians in the time of the pagan Roman Empire. So at the time when Paul was speaking, who led the pagan Roman Empire? The Caesars. Okay? So, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, because this is already after Simon Magus. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So that means, in other words, only he, the Caesar, who is now leading this pagan empire, will lead until he be taken out of the way. 
but Paul couldn't say that in these plain words, in writ. He said this in these plain words when he still was with them. As in verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Paul was clear when he spoke to the Thessalonians face to face, vis-à-vis. -vis. He cannot be that clear in a letter, because if that letter had gotten in the wrong hands, Paul would be accused of sedition, revolution, and all that stuff. Terrorism, if that word even existed at that time. But he makes it very clear that when the Roman pagan Caesar is taken out of the way, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That means, from the moment on, the pagan Caesars are not in power anymore. Somebody else will take over that power, that mystery of iniquity that doth already work in the time of Paul. And that wicked, that is then revealed, shall lead, shall reign until the Lord comes back, because it says in verse 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it is very clear that he who leads after the pagan Caesars are gone, is the one that leads until Jesus Christ comes back. And because we have in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 7, Daniel 2 with the statue and in Daniel 7 with the uh, four beasts, we know that there are in Babylon foretold to Daniel four kingdoms to reign over the world until the world is going to be destroyed. How and why is the world going to be destroyed? Well, when we just, when we just have a look at... Um, at that statue that we can see from uh, Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to put the picture in here and you'll see that. Let me enhance that a little bit. Then we see that we have, of course, the head of Babylon, the head of gold, which is resembling the kingdom of Babylon, succeeded by the breast of silver, the kingdom of Persia, succeeded by the thighs of brass, which is the kingdom of Greece, which is then succeeded by the legs of iron Rome. The legs of iron, a kingdom divided in itself, and the feet of iron and clay, the divided nations from 476 until the present time. Meaning, in the legs of Rome you had the emperor of Rome, the Caesar, ruling the time of Paul, from 168 BC to 476 AD. And then came the same kingdom under the guise of Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church, what we have today, until the, the kingdoms will be destroyed by a rock that is not cut out with hands, which is Jesus Christ, who will destroy all earthly kingdoms to set up his heavenly kingdom here on earth. Okay? So, when we see this, when we understand these, only these two verses, just Daniel chapter 2, what you see here, and Daniel chapter 7, which is about the four beasts. Let me see if I can give you there another picture of the four beasts, maybe, that I have here. Uh, this is just the sea beast. Uh, we don't need that. I would need a picture of the four beasts. This is chapter 7. The four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, you know, the eagle, Babylon, the bear, that is uh, Medo-Persia, the leopard, that is Greece, and then the dreadful beast, that is the fourth beast. And when then we take what I just read to you before, um, the um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7, we already understand very precisely who is ruling this world, who the Antichrist actually is. And when we then turn, of course, to Revelation, 
And in Revelation we have several chapters that speak about the Antichrist and explain the Antichrist, starting with, of course, chapter 13, where we can read that on chapter 1, John wrote down from the Revelation, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw, the, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and, above, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. When we then read on, of course, in chapter 17, reading, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Ha! Huh. Scarlet color. Okay. Um, scarlet. Do I have a picture of scarlet color? Oh, yes, you bet. How about this one? Bishops and cardinals in Rome. And how about this one? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Revelation 17, verse 4. And of course it continues also in chapter 18. But I'm not going through the whole Bible now. I just want to make to you very clear that, for example, when you take Genesis 3, verse 15, let me <laughs> just open that. I have the Bible in my hand right right now anyway. So I can, I can read the exact words that God told us. And... Um, it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the very first announcement of a Savior, Jesus Christ, coming to save the world. The seed of the woman. Yeah, And then, further on, we read, of course, in Daniel. Now I just have to see to open <laughs> the book of Daniel in my Bible here. Yeah? I didn't plan this. And in Daniel we read, of course, in chapter, 20, uh, in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So we have seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the people of Daniel and Babylon, the Jews. Then we have seven weeks and sixty-two weeks makes sixty-nine weeks. And after the threescore and two weeks, meaning 62 weeks and the seven weeks that preceded those, so in altogether it means 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus Christ went to the cross, not for himself. He went to the cross for us. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So, the people that come, the people of the prince that shall come, are the people, the tenth Roman legion, that besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, as Jesus foretold in Matthew 24. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So these are the desolations that we are in. You no need to need you don't need to look for a seven year tribulation. No. There is no seven year tribulation coming. Desolations are determined until the end of the war. That war started after Jesus Christ was put on the cross. That war started in 70 AD when the prince, when the people of the prince that shall come, the prince, was 
the son of the reigning Roman Emperor Vespasius at that time, Titus. And he came and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that end was with the flood. <clears throat> that flood is a tsunami. We still feel it today. All the wars around the world. This is what was Daniel predicted here. And it continues in verse 27, And he, so Jesus Christ, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. With many, yeah. Not everybody is saved. Grace is through election of God, through selection of God. And those many are mentioned here. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Yeah, that's it, because after three and a half years after he was anointed, he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, three and a half years later, in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease by going to the cross and taking upon his body and his blood the sins of all the world. And for the overspreading of the abomination he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. The consummation is when he comes back and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, we have Genesis 3.15, the first announcement of Jesus Christ, of the Messiah coming to save the world in the Bible. We have Daniel 9 giving us the precise timeline so that anybody who studied the Bible at the time could know when Jesus Christ was coming. Then we have in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, as I read to you, about that he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And of course you have, for example, Revelation 13. So we know precisely who the Antichrist is. It is the papacy. It is the office of the papacy. Every pope in succession, from the very first until the present one, and until the very last that will ever reign on these earth, is the Antichrist. The papacy is the Antichrist. There is no other. And the Bible is very clear about that. And only when we know and understand who the Antichrist is, and we understand who our enemy is, namely the Antichrist, the Pope, then we can understand the present and we can make predictions on the hand of the Bible for the future. Now the point being, since the Pope is the Antichrist and the Pope is the head of the quote-unquote Church of Jesus Christ, as he calls itself, well, the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, never ever was Christian. Never ever was. So, what's this about? The Pope is the head of the Roman Catholic Church, he is the Antichrist, and he has a lot of of people working for him. Satan has a lot of people in this world working for him. Because the Antichrist is nothing else but the personage of Satan. I would like to say the Pope calls himself Jesus Christ in the flesh. I would like to call the Pope Satan in the flesh. Martin Luther and all reformers agreed with me, and I guess even the Bible agrees with me, that we can say that. And all these little minions that the Pope uses to achieve his again agenda are in the very first place the people who started the Counter-Reformation. The Anti-Reformation. The Reformation gave us the freedoms that we know today, and the anti-reformation is going to take all these freedoms away. Look around you. Don't you see our freedoms that our forefathers fought for in all these years diminishing more and more every day? Isn't that easy to see when you look around, especially in the United States of America, with shortly after 9-11 the Patriot Act and then a little bit later the NDAA? Your country is run by executive orders by a president who acts like a Caesar, who acts like a king. He is a king. All presidents, all prime ministers, all kings of these earth are kings. And they obey the king of kings of this world. The self-pronounced king of kings and lord of lords of this world. The Pope. 
the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the mystery of iniquity revealed. There is no question who the Antichrist is. The only question is, will you see it? And when you see it, will you understand it and live accordingly? Choose Jesus Christ and warn your brethren. Because that's what this whole book reading is all about. That's what all the book readings are about that I do on my channel. This is what everything I do is all about. This is what everything Tom Fress does is all about on Inquisition Update. Warning the people of the coming Inquisition because the Pope is the Antichrist and Satan knows he has only a little time and he is advancing his agenda very, very fast. Look at all the changes that have been made from 2001 up to today and then you see what I mean. There's no secret about this. Satan is transformed into an angel of light and therefore it is, uh, uh, therefore it is no wonder that his, um, that his ministers are also transformed into ministers of righteousness. Politicians. Priests. Pastors of the ecumenical apostate reformed movement all working for Satan all working for the agenda that Satan can come to fulfill what he announced that he wants to fulfill when we read Isaiah chapter 14 now let me see if I can very fast open Isaiah I think Isaiah chapter 14 and there we read in verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations isn't Satan weakening weakening all the nations in this world for thou hast said in thine heart I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the most high Lucifer says here in heaven that he wants to be like God and what is the response what does God tell us? Yet, he says, thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Lucifer gets his goal. He will get his adoration. He will be like the Most High, because the people are duped into believing that he is whatever he plays to be. Maybe even the second coming of Christ. And he will get the adoration that he wanted. But yet he shall be brought down to, the hell, to hell, to the sides of the pit, as it is written. We don't have much time. And many people will never just pick up a Bible and start reading, believing and understanding. So that's why there are many secular books, like the history of the Jesuits, or the secret history of the Jesuits, which we are reading Oh, I was planning on reading today. <laughs> and these books give us the history, the hidden history, the secret history of the Counter-Reformation. Of those people, of that organization that actually works for Satan in that way to take away all our freedoms that our forefathers fought for. And that's why it is so important to read, discuss, and understand quote-unquote secular books like the secret history of the Jesuits, like All Roads Lead to Rome, which I read before this, and still there are, I think, a few videos that I have to upload. I don't know. Let's see when I upload this. I don't know that. And books like what Tom Fress read, The Global Vatican, Roman Civil Liberty, and so many other books, 
And right now, in 2017, he is reading Luther in his own words. Wonderful work. Explaining to us from not only the view of Luther, but especially from the view of Luther on the Antichrist. And Tom does a very wonderful job in that. So check out Inquisition Update on that. That is the reason why Tom Press has his ministry, Inquisition Update. That is why I have this ministry, if you can call it that, Hour of the Truth, Jogla 66, my YouTube channel. And I'm doing to reading these books. I'm going to read these books. So this was, of course, a very long introduction. I don't know <laughs> if we are going to go uh, very far today. Um, but anyway, I, 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 I wanted to start with this, but uh, we are not going through Chapter 8 because um, the recording is now already running for 31 minutes. So, uh, And I know that this is a long chapter because, as you see, Chapter 8 deals with uh, the Jesuits and General Boulanger and also with the Jesuits and the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, the Dreyfus Affair is something very interesting. I addressed that already in the book reading Behind the Dictators that you can see in the uh, in the playlists of my, on my YouTube channel, Jogla 66, uh, Behind the Dictators. I read that book from Herbert Leo, Lehman, uh, Herbert Leo Lehman from uh, 1942. And there he dealt also, I think, in Chapter 2 or 3 with the Dreyfus Affair. And uh, we are also dealing with that Dreyfus Affair over here. And I will, uh, because I prepared that for you, a Wikipedia article on the Dreyfus Affair that you can read here, the Dreyfus Affair, and what it was all about. It was about starting anti-Semitism in France. In the end of the 19th century. Why? Because anti-Semitism was needed and the ground must be laid for the persecution of the Jews during the time of the Second World War so that the Antichrist had a reason to found the nation-state of Israel after the Second World War. Therefore needed to be anti-Semitism. Therefore needed to be the persecution of the Jews. As if that is something new for the Roman Catholic Church. Hello, the Roman Catholic Church persecutes the Jews for more than 2,000 years already. Yes, more than 2,000 years, even today. Because the Jews have been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church even before Christ. Because the Jews were, at that time, the remnant of Israel, God-fearing people. And the Roman Catholic Church were the heathen, Nothing else but the heathen, the pagan Romans. So they have been persecuted, the Jews and Israel, by Rome, and before that by Greece, and before that by Medo-Persia, and before that by Babylon, throughout history. Nothing new under the sun. But we are going into some kind of a, well... And fight, let's say, and therefore they needed this anti-Semitism. Oh, you can look this word up. I didn't do it, but I bet you that this word didn't even exist before the 18th or 19th century. Like so many. Anyway, the book that I am reading today, <laughs> finally when I come to this, <laughs> Chapter 8 of The Secret History of the Jesuits, um, starts with the Jesuits and General Boulanger, and in the second part of this chapter we read about the Dreyfus Affair, which is more important than you probably understand right now. So let's go to the reading. The hostility of which the devout party pretended to be the victim, let me just make this a little bit bigger here, this is too small for me, at the end of the 19th century from the Republican state would not have lacked justification even though this hostility, or more accurately mistrust, had been even more positive. In fact, the clerical opposition to the regime which France gave herself freely showed itself at every opportunity, according to the Abbé Brugret in 1873, the attempt to, is re to restore monarchy with the Count of Champ uh, Chambord failed, even though strongly supported by the clergy, because the pretender stubbornly refused to adopt the tricolored flag, to him the emblem of revolution. We are dealing with the time of 1870-1875 in, in the chapter before this one that I read, chapter 7, you remember. 
And there France lost the war against Germany, but France also was a republic. And even the Jesuits were expelled. Again, so in 1873 the attempt to restore monarchy, because at that time it was a republic, with the Count of Chambord failed, even though strongly supported by the clergy. So the clergy, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Antichrist, supported a monarchy in that republic. Why? Because a monarchy is an absolute system of ruling. Like the papacy. An absolute monarchy. They do not support a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, a grassroots government, a government where the people rule themselves. No, 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 no. The ruler of the people has to be chosen by the Pope. That's what the whole idiotic story of the quote-unquote New World Order is all about. The restoration of the Old World Order of the papacy to the power it had before the time of the Reformation. That's the whole secret. Well, of course, they never tell you, because if you knew, if you understood, oh, what would happen if the people understood and would awake finally? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen if the people finally awoke to the reality that the New World Order is nothing else but the restoration of the Old World Order to the supremacy of the Pope that he had before the Reformation? in the Western Hemisphere and now re restoring this power globally? Wow! How wonderful if the people would only understand! Well, read books like this or watch videos like this or listen to my rantings like this and this maybe will wake you up and you will maybe have a chance to understand. The Count of Chambert was supported by the clergy because the pretender stubbornly refused to adopt the tricolored flag, to him the emblem of revolution. Quote, such as it is, Catholicism seems bound to politics or to a certain kind of politics. Loyalty to the monarchy was transmitted from generation to generation in the old noble families as well as in the middle classes and the common people in the Catholic regions of the West and of the South. Their nostalgia of an ancient and idealized regime pictured in an epic Middle Age was coupled with the wishes of fervent Catholics, whose main preoccupation was the salvation of the religion. They rallied behind Bayot with the legitimate and devout royal family of Chambord, considered to be the form of government most favorable to the Church. <laughs> yeah. This seemed to be the government most favorable to the church. Do you want to know what the government most favorable to the uh, Jesuits is? I'm going to show you. Civilta uh, Catholica, also something that we will come to in this book. But the Civilta Catholica is the house organ of the Jesuits, and they state that fascism... It's the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. You can read that for yourself if you want to, but Civilta Catholica published that. The house organ of the Jesuits. So, of course, the legitimate, devout royal family is the form of government most favorable to the Church. Next best thing. Huh? Here they say fascism. If you can't get fascism, well, get a king. Out of the union, the author continues, of these political and religious forces was born in the strained situation after the war, that's the war with Germany in 1870, a kind of reactionary mysticism illustrated perfectly by Monsignor Pied, Bishop of Poitiers, and its best incarnation in the ecclesiastical world. Quote, France, who awaits another chief and calls for a master, will again receive from God the scepter of the universe which fell from her hands for a while. On the day when she will have learned anew 
how to go down on her knees. Unquote. Isn't that an interesting quote? France will again receive the scepter of the universe on the day she will have learned a new how to go down on her knees. Hey, you want to make America great again? <laughs> like Donald Trump says? <laughs> Get on your knees! The same that was working for France in the end of the 19th century, when she wants to get great again, she has to fall, fall on her knees for a while. Then she will have the scepter of God. You want to make America great again? Well, fall down on your knees. How can America fall down on their knees? When the country is purged of the cancer, the Roman Catholic Church sees in the liberals and Protestants that inhabit that country. That's how. The picture described by a Catholic historian is significant. It helps to understand the moves which followed a few years later the unsuccessful uh, restoration attempt of 1873. The same Catholic historian describes in the following manner the political attitude of the clergy at that time. Quote, At election time, the, presbyter, uh, the presbyteries I'm sorry. <laughs> At election time, the presbyteries become centers for the reactionary candidates. The priests and officiating ministers make home calls for the electoral propaganda, slander the republic and its new laws on teaching. They declare that those who vote for the free thinkers, the present government or Freemasons described as bandits, riffraffs and thieves, are guilty of mortal sin. One declares that an adulterous woman will be forgiven more easily than those who send their children to lay schools. Another one, that it is better to strangle a child than give support to the regime. A third one, that he will refuse the last sacraments to those who vote for the regime's partisans. The threats are carried out. Republican and anti-clerical tradesmen are boycotted. Destitute people are refused any help and workmen are dismissed. These excesses from a clergy affected more and more by Jesuitic ultramontanism are even less acceptable from the fact that they emanate from ecclesiastics paid by the government as the Concordat is still enforced. You remember the Concordat that France signed. We were speaking about the Concordat that Germany signed last year, but France also had an Concordat. Ecclesiastics paid by the government. So the spiritual power is paid by the civil power. But the civil power must do what the spiritual power says, not the other way around. Also, the author continues, the majority of public opinion is not happy with all with uh, at all with this pressure on the consciences, as aforementioned author writes. Quote, as we have seen, the French people as a whole is indifferent to religious matters, and we cannot mistake the hereditary observance of religious practices for a real faith. Unquote. The fact is is that the political map of France is identical to her religious map. Huh? Did you understand that well, dear listener? Why doesn't that highlighting go here? The fact is that the political map of France is identical to her religious map. That's why the Roman Catholic Church is in the first place a political power and in the second place a religious. And the political map of France is identical to the religious map. And this is a fact that can be drawn for every country of the world. We can say that in the regions where faith is strong, the French people vote for Catholic candidates elsewhere. They consciously elect anti-clerical deputies and senators. They do not want clericalism which is ecclesiastical authority in the matters of politics and commonly called the government of priests. 
the government of priests, a theocracy. That is what you're going to have when you combine state and church. That is what you are going to have in the United States of America, which is the mirror of the first beast, the second beast, the church and state together. But now you say, oh, Jörg, but that's not true because Trump, you know, he uh, revokes um, the law from uh, uh, the president that came after Kennedy, uh, Lyndon. Uh, the Johnson, uh, uh, the Johnson Agreement, or whatever he, he's going to call that 501c3 status. Oh, Jörg, you are wrong with that. No, I'm not. <sighs> Go to my video, Donaldus Trumpius, in the uh, in the in the playlist Hour of the Truth, and I will explain to you that the revocation of this um, uh, of the Johnson Amendment or Johnson Act or whatever he calls that 501c3 disaster in the United States of America, that the revocation of that does not mean that the churches are free. Because I state in that video that you can look up in the playlist Hour of the Truth, and um, I can't show you here because I don't have that uh, internet site open because the camera asks much of the power of my computer, um, but I'm going to show you the picture and uh, you, will, you will see that there. Um, that video that I made on Donald Trump there, I was, uh, it is called Donaldus Trumpius, Hour of the Truth, Donaldus Trumpius, because I Romanize his name. Um, and we're going to see that right here. This is the picture. When he revokes the Johnson Agreement, or whatever you want to call this 501c3 disaster over the United States of America, he can do that now because the Johnson Agreement was imposed on the Americans in the 1950s, 1954. But in the meantime, we have had Vatican II, and we have had, a, for the Roman Catholic Church, a very successful ecumenical movement. And with this ecumenical movement, and the teaching in all the seminaries for all the priests and all the pastors, all the quote-unquote protestant pastors, there's only the teaching of a futurist antichrist, according to the uh, to the book of Francisco Ribera in 1591, a Jesuit, who came up with the idea of a future antichrist, a single person coming seven years before the end of time. I'm not going back into that. I think I addressed that already in the first part of this reading. Daniel chapter 9 is completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ, verses 24 through 27, and all the rest is completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ. There is no future seven-year tribulation. There is no rapture of the church. There is only the second coming. And until then we will have tribulation because this is determined until the consummation, as it is stated in Daniel. So because all the seminaries, all the schools, all the universities, Everything in the United States of America and elsewhere over the world is completely infiltrated by Jesuitical teaching, learning against learning, Medici learning, as I explained to you in the book Rulers of Evil. With this future Antichrist agenda now planted into the brains of the people in the United States of America and elsewhere also, but we are speaking now about the United States of America because Donald Trumpius is the king rolling, ruling over there. With all that done, and that successful ecumenical movement, and nobody in the United States of America today recognizes the Pope as the Antichrist anymore, they don't need no 501c3 anymore because there is no pastor coming into any church teaching anything from the pulpit that is not Jesuitical teaching, that is not in line with the Roman Catholic Church, that is not in line with the Jesuits. There are no independent pastors who speak these anymore. These few that there are, maybe like Bill Hughes, and of course, never to forget uh, Richard Bennett, those few who are there will be taken care of. 
at the time. But they don't have that many followers because they don't have the financial background. Because you can only get financial backing when you are teaching mainstream lies. When you are teaching the real truth, you will not have very big funds. Inquisition Update doesn't have any funds. Hour of the Truth doesn't have any funds. But you know, freely we received by the Holy Spirit, freely we give. So Donaldus Trumpius can revoke the 501c3 Johnson Amendment as much as he wants. It doesn't change anything in the political scene or on the political scene of the United States of America because the Jesuits have infiltrated all the seminaries, all the pulpits, and all in the pulpits they teach a future Antichrist. Nobody teaches the Pope as the Antichrist anymore. So 501c3 is redundant. It has done its work the last 60 years or 63. Revoke it. Doesn't matter. Donaldus Trumpius will not be your savior. Your savior is only Jesus Christ. Okay? So, how long have I been ranting on? Okay, we still have a few minutes to go for the full hour. So, I'm going to read on. But I want to make sure that you understand the government of priests that are highlighted here. The government of priests is a theocracy. And the only theocracy that I want to be under is the same theocracy that Israel has been under in the Law and the Prophets, in the so-called Old Testament. God, the creator God of the Bible, Jesus Christ on top, and not the Pope. Here, the government of priests, that theocracy, is a theocracy of the Antichrist. Follows another quote, and many of these quotes come from Adrian Donset. So I'm going to show you who Adrian Donset was, because I have a picture of him here. And um, then we know he was a historian and author in France, Adrian Donset. And from him comes this and a few other quotes within the reading of this book. But this one comes from Adrian Donset, quote, For a large number of Catholics, the fact that the priest, this troublesome man, interferes through the sermons, instructions, and the confessional's prescriptions in the behavior of the faithful, checking thoughts, sentiments, acts, food and drink, and even the intimacies of married life, is enough. They intend at least to limit this em his empire by preserving their independence as citizens. Unquote. <laughs> well, if the priest already has the power over all the instructions through the confessional prescriptions of the behavior of the people, checking the thoughts, the sentiments, the acts, the food and the drink, and even the intimacies of married life, meaning controlling the bedroom through the confessionals, and therefore you have to really read uh, The Priest, the Woman and the Confessional by uh, Charles Chiniqui to understand that. What is left? Oh, okay, you can go vote. <laughs> like, like we all do every few years to put our vote and then earn a dead vote of rigged elections because you always choose a candidate that is approved by the Antichrist. Not only in America, all over the world, but in America. Well, have a look at my video of Donaldus Trumpius and have a look at my video, they are laughing at you, and uh, you'll see what I mean. The author continues, we would like to see this spirit of independence as lively today. But even though the opinion of that large number of Catholics was such, the Ultramontanes would not disarm and pursue at every opportunity the fight against the hated regime. They thought for a while that they had found the providential man in the person of General Boulanger, Minister for War in 1886. Now, listen to this. Minister for War. Why is this called today the Minister of Defense? <laughs> casistry because it's all about war here at least they were honest 
with the name they gave General Boulanger, the Minister of War in 1886, who, having organized his personal propaganda extremely well, looking like being a future dictator. Oh, here comes now another danger. A tacit agreement, wrote Mr. or Monsieur Adrien Dancet, still in the picture here to the left, is established between the general and the Catholics and becomes clear during the summer. He has also concluded a secret agreement with royalist members of parliament such as Baron de Macau and Count de Moon, faithfully defenders of the church at the assembly. The phlegmatic ministers for the interior, minister for the interior, Constance, threatens to arrest him and on the 1st of April, ha ha ha, April fools, the dictator candidate escapes to Brussels with his mistress. Quote, From now on, Boulangism declines rapidly. France has not been taken. She recovers. Boulangism is crushed at the polls on the 22nd of September and the 6th of October, 1889. Unquote. We can read from the pen of the same historian, Dancet, what the attitude of the Pope of that time was regarding this adventurer. He was Antichrist Pope Leo XIII, who, in 1878, had succeeded Antichrist Pope Pius IX, the Pope of the Syllabus of Errors that we spoke about earlier, and who pretended to advise the faithful of France to join the Republican regime. Quote, in August 1889, so that's a hundred years after the starting of the French Revolution, to remind you from 1789, the German ambassador to the Vatican pretends that the Pope sees in General Boulanger the man who will overthrow the French Republic and re-establish the throne. We can read an article in which the Monitor of Rome envisages that the dictatorial candidate will take over power and that the Church could benefit greatly from it. General Boulanger sent one of his former officers to Rome with a letter for Antichrist Pope Leo XIII in which Boulanger promised the Pope that, quote, that on the day when he would hold in his hands the sword of France, he would do his uttermost to make the rights of the papacy acknowledged, unquote. So what does that mean? They are using the Minister of War, General Boulanger, to put in front, and he says that he will put the Roman Catholic Church back into power in France. Such was this Jesuit pontiff, the intransigent clerics objected to this supposed excess of liberalism. The Boulangist crisis revealed well enough the action led by the religious party against the lay republic under the cover of nationalism. But the colorless nature of the principal character as well as the resistance of a majority of the nation had defeated the attempt in spite of all this forced agitation. Nevertheless, these chauvinistic tactics had proved quite effective, especially in Paris, and they were to be used again at another and better opportunity. This came about, or was it provoked? And the disciples of Loyola were, of course, at the head of this movement. Their friends are there, wrote Monsieur Pierre Dominique, a bigoted nobility, a bourgeoisie which rejects Voltaire and many military men. They will especially work on the army, and the result will be the famous alliance of the sword and the sprinkler of holy water, unquote. Well, that's going to be an alliance that you will experience over the United States of America in the future too. The famous allies of the sword and the sprinkler of holy water, the combination of church and state for a hundred percent in the United States of America is going to come. Be ye warned, read books like this and learn from the history. There is nothing new under the sun, it all happened before. What happened here in France will happen in the United States of America. 
Another quote also from Adrian Doncet reads, in, in 1890, it is not the king of France's conscience, they rule anymore, but the general staff, or at least its chief. And now the Dreyfus affair breaks out, a real civil war which divides France into two. And before we continue, because we have now the first mention of the Dreyfus affair, as you can read here, I will take a break and we will read on, of course, with the next time of the reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits. Because this was the affair of Boulanger and next comes the affair of Dreyfus. But this will be for another time because we are already at an hour with this reading. And um, I don't want to go much about an hour, more over an hour, because we all need a little break after this heavy and intensive reading. And I hope that I could sharpen your understanding and that you are going into yourself a little bit and ask yourself questions that in the end you know only the Bible can answer. And if I can turn you to read the Bible, well, that's the best thing to do. Because only there is the truth to be found. So, Juggler66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you, thank you for watching, listening and commenting, and until next time, to another reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Until then, God bless you, and bye-bye. A specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is, in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day! Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy and the other is the doctrine the temporal power and that is dealing with world government of course both because you can see that even the pope and his own individual office he meet those requirements uh, he is not only the head of his church as he called himself john paul ii the present pope he said he is the pastor of his church he is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits, if you were not aware of that, 
President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.